In this video, we will be looking at the synaptic release of neurotransmitters and their postsynaptic receptor interactions. Here we have an empty vesicle in the presynaptic cell, and surrounding it we have protons and neurotransmitters. For this video, the neurotransmitter will be acetylcholine. Through vesicles, neurotransmitters are released from the synapse. The movement of neurotransmitters into these vesicles occurs through two membrane proteins within the vesicular membrane. So the VTPA subtop uses ATP to first transfer protons into the vesicle. Once a high concentration of protons is established inside the cell, another vesicular membrane protein, the vesicle neurotransmitter transporter, uses an antipore system moving neurotransmitters in for protons that are pumped out. Once the vesicle is full, it will move along the cytoskeleton to be stored. It will remain unused until an action potential occurs in the neuron and reaches the axon terminal. When the action potential happens, the vesicle will be put into motion, moving towards the active zone along the presynaptic membrane. After the vesicle reaches the active zone, the next step is membrane fusion, which occurs through multiple processes. The vesicular membrane is bound to the presynaptic membrane through four proteins. Synaptobrevine is the only vesicle membrane protein in this process, and binds to two proteins upon the neural membrane, SNAP25 and Syntaxin. MUNC18 is also present and is a cystal protein that binds to the structure. SNAP is a protein that works to hold the rest of the proteins together. Once all the proteins are firmly connected, they have successfully formed a snare complex. The snare complex functions to hold the two membranes together so that they can be fused. Before the snare complex is finished, it needs another protein which is not part of either membrane to be attached. This protein is called complexin, which is needed to bind before the snare complex can be seen as complete. The complexin not only helps to facilitate the snare complex's completion, it also causes a process called superbinding, which is when the two membranes are pulled extremely close together. Although the membranes are nearly touching at this point, they cannot be fused without another process taking place. This process is called Ca2 plus triggering. In this process, calcium flows in through voltage-gated calcium channels that are open upon an action potential reaching the axon terminal. To make sure that the calcium channels are near the vesicle during binding, several proteins are connected together to keep the channel next to the vesicle. The active zone is a specialized area in the membrane that holds many Ca2 plus voltage-gated channels. The channels have two proteins attached to it as another measure to make sure that the vesicle is at the proper place for fusion. These two proteins are RIM and RIMBP. When the vesicle comes to release neurotransmitters, the RIM protein will bind to the RAP3 protein on the vesicle membrane. This binding occurs so that the vesicle will remain in place near the calcium channel. So the question is, why is so much focus dedicated to calcium? That is because without calcium, vesicle fusion cannot occur. The protein synaptotagmine, which is on the vesicle membrane, is a calcium sensor that needs exactly 5 calcium ions to bind in order to trigger vesicle fusion. None of the Ca2 plus triggering process could occur without the help of the action potential, which is not only responsible for the vesicle to move to the active site, but it's also necessary for the voltage-gated calcium channels to open. Now that the snare complex is complete and the calcium has been bound, the vesicle can finally fuse with the neuron membrane, allowing it to release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Once released, the neurotransmitters can now bind the ligand-gated ion channels. It is critical for the neurotransmitter to go to the correct postsynaptic surface. But how is this ensured? There are proteins on both the synaptic surfaces that make sure that the two membranes are always extremely close to one another, so the neurotransmitter remains in the synaptic cleft. Cateterin is one of these proteins in this process, and it's on both the pre- and post-membranes, and it's used to keep them connected. There are also two more proteins. One is unique to the presynaptic membrane, and one is unique to the postsynaptic membrane, and these are norexin and norelligin. And these proteins have two jobs. The first is the same as cadherin, just to keep these two membranes connected. But unlike cadherin, they also have another job, and that's to make sure that a presynapse is specifically connected to a postsynapse. And they do this by having unique structures within themselves that make sure that they can only bind to one another. Once all the neurotransmitters are released, then the vesicle is recycled. After the vesicle is fully bound to the membrane of the neuron, the snare complex will then separate through a protein called NSF which will break down the complex into its base proteins. Now, one of the ways which this is accomplished is by the clathrin-mediated system, in which the vesicle is surrounded by clathrin, and then a diamine protein wraps around the neck of the vesicle, so that it can constrict the two membranes until it's pulled apart. 
Up until this point, the main focus has been on the presynaptic process and what happens in the neuron that is releasing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Let's get back to acetylcholine after it's already left the presynaptic neuron. The journey across the synaptic cleft is a dangerous one for neurotransmitters, and a lot of them will not make it to the receptor. This is because it can be very detrimental to the nervous system if neurotransmitters are allowed to just leave the cell and float around as they please. So to combat this, there are two processes in place to make sure that the neurotransmitters are cleaned up after they are released. And the reason that many neurotransmitters will not be able to bind to the receptor is because that these two processes can distinguish between a neurotransmitter that has just left the vesicle and one that has already been bound to a receptor. The first process is enzymatic cleaving, which will actually break apart the neurotransmitter. And this is done through enzymes that float around the synaptic cleft. These enzymes are designed so that their binding site has a specific, specific configuration to correspond to a certain neurotransmitter. So in our case, where our neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, the enzyme that will be responsible for the cleaving is acetylcholine esterase. The other way that neurotransmitters are cleaned up is through reuptake, which will recycle the neurotransmitter without breaking it down. On the presynaptic membrane, along with glial cells, there are plasma membrane neurotransmitter transporters, which are channels that allow the neurotransmitter to enter the cell so that they can be repackaged and used again. These channels are symporters, which means not only do they take neurotransmitters into the cell, but they also pull in sodium ions at the same time. Now that acetylcholine has made it to the postsynapse, it will bind to its designated receptor. In this case, it will be a ligand-gated ion channel, which will open when two acetylcholine bind to the binding sites. In the case that the postsynaptic cell is also a neuron, ions will rush in and cause an action potential. More often though, acetylcholine is associated with a neuromuscular junction, which means that the postsynaptic cell is a skeletal muscle cell. So when the neurotransmitter binds to the receptor, it will allow for sodium to flow into the muscle, ultimately leading to a muscle contraction.